This is an introduction to the audio-described version of the short film In Search of Greek Theatre, Medea, from the National Theatre. The film lasts for nine and a half minutes and will follow immediately after this three-minute introduction. It's presented by Dr Lucy Jackson, Assistant Professor in Ancient Greek Literature at Durham University, and Erin Lee, Head of Archive at the National Theatre. Lucy is a white woman in her thirties with short, dark brown hair and small hoop earrings. She wears a mustard yellow cardigan over black t-shirt and black jeans. Erin is a white woman in her thirties with long brown hair pulled back in a ponytail and glasses with black frames. She wears a black short-sleeved top with lace detail on the sleeves. In the introductory images, Lucy and Erin are in a large room with archive materials set out on tables, including scale models of sets, folders of notes and grey archive boxes containing photos and hand-painted set and costume designs. There are also costumes and masks on stands. The full-face masks have openings for eyes and mouths and are painted a single neutral colour, with long hair made of twine dyed black or bright red. In the archive reading room, a researcher sits down and puts on headphones to watch a recording. As Erin and Lucy speak, images of documents, photographs and sketches from the archive appear in close-up, along with video from the 2014 National Theatre production of Medea. Helen McCrory, who plays Medea, first appears in a charcoal grey vest and khaki trousers. She's a white woman, slim and muscular, her wavy brown hair put up into a crown-shaped hairdo that recalls classical Greek sculptures. She later wears a stylish jumpsuit with a v-neck and fitted waist, made of white crepe silk that falls in soft flowing pleats. The legs are so wide that it resembles a floor-length dress. Her husband Jason, played by Danny Sapani, is a tall black man with neat greying beard and short afro hair. He wears a grey three-piece suit and silk tie, with a pink rose in the buttonhole. Medea and Jason stand in a vast room in modernist style, with exposed concrete and marble, a geometric carpet surrounding a square of wooden floor. On the upper levels, a balcony overlooks the main room. In the room behind, wedding guests celebrate among gauzy drapes in pastel shades of pink, blue and violet, with white balloons and a tiered wedding cake. The thirteen young women of the chorus first appear in print dresses or blouses and skirts. They all carry matching bridesmaids' dresses on hangers, folded over their arms, and they later wear the dresses, their 50s style with fitted bodices and flaring skirts, in heavy pink silk, printed with large flowers. On the ground floor, at the back of the space, two steps lead up to a wide opening edged by red velvet curtains, suggesting a picture window onto a terrace. But there's no glass. The room opens directly onto a sinister forest wreathed in mist with trees with bare, twisted branches. The photo used on the poster shows Helen McCrory as Medea, her bare knees emerging from an oversized, almost military, navy blue coat as she crouches with her back against a tree in deep mist. Lucy and Erin look through grey archive folders and carefully hand photos and drawings to each other, smiling as they read production notes and diaries. National Theatre, in search of Greek theatre, Medea. I'm Lucy Jackson, Assistant Professor in Ancient Greek Literature. I'm Erin Lee, Head of Archive at the National Theatre. In this series of films, Erin and I will be looking at some of the Greek tragedies that have been staged at the National Theatre. Using the records held in the theatre's archive as a starting point, we'll look at the practicalities of staging an ancient Greek play in a modern theatre building. The archive is home to thousands of items, from photographs to prompt scripts, technical drawings to set models, dating all the way back to our opening night in 1963. Every production has left behind some traces of the multiple artistic choices and practical considerations that go into making a performance. By exploring these plays as staged productions, rather than as pieces of literature, we begin to see these ancient works in a new light. Going behind the scenes of the productions makes us ask fresh questions about why these plays and their myths are still relevant today. Euripides' Medea was staged at the National Theatre in 2014, directed by Carrie Cracknell in a new version by Ben Power. 
I gave you sons. I bledged them out for you and you have thrown me away. You have turned everything upside down. The promises mean nothing to you. Do you think that the gods have died that you could so easily break the oaths you made in their names? You see this damned hand which once you held. You see this body you used to embrace, polluted now, having been touched by you, infected and infested with your sin. Exploring the Chorus. In a newspaper interview, Ben Power talks about the creation of the chorus as a major artistic decision when staging any Greek tragedy. The National has produced tragedies that present the chorus as individual people, as we saw in Polly Findlay's Antigone, but also as a more formal, structured entity, singing and speaking in unison. This was the approach taken in Peter Hall's landmark Oristia in 1981. The chorus in Carrie Cracknell's Medea explored a middle ground. When we first meet the chorus, they are dressed as individuals, but they appear in an eerily stylized straight line on the upper layer of the set. The costume bible reveals that each of the 13 chorus members were fitted with their own outfits. They share an aesthetic, but are still distinct from one another. From the outset, they seem to occupy a space somewhere in between realism and something a bit more supernatural. Individual chorus members speak their lines, but they also move as a group, sometimes in unison, sometimes with a few of them dancing. Over the course of the play, they gradually lose their individuality, even more so when they change into matching bridesmaids' dresses. By the end of the play, they have morphed into something almost otherworldly, when they perform an unsettling and violent dance and are dressed in muddied and torn versions of these dresses. A note for the wigs, hair and makeup team says that the chorus should look muddied and scratched when they appear through the forest in these broken down versions of their dresses. It's as if they've been drawn down from the polite, clean wedding party on the upper layer of the set, down into the mysterious and menacing forest that lies directly beneath and which stands for the immense supernatural power of the character of Medea. They are no longer separate and above, merely commenting on her actions. By their failure to intervene and stop her murdering her own sons, they have enabled Medea's final awful act. Exploring the costume, the camera tracks over a deeply bloodstained garment. The two outfits that Medea wears in this production give us important information about her character, her mental state, and about the world of the play. We looked at... Um, Helen McCrory. The idea that she was wearing some of Jason's clothes. Oh. That there was an idea that she hadn't released, she hadn't let go um, of his smell, of him. At the beginning, she's dressed in these baggy old clothes that belong to Jason, which shows, as Helen says, that she hasn't been able to move on. She's stuck. The change into her white flowing jumpsuit signals that she has a new plan and a way out. This outfit was made especially for Helen, as we can see from this internal label giving the name of the maker. Will Skeet. The flowing lines are like those you might see on a Grecian statue. We still occasionally see designers such as Dior and Dolce & Gabbana making similar callbacks in their collections. The fact that it's a trouser suit gestures towards Medea's more masculine energy. This masculinity is a prominent feature of her character in the ancient Greek play and adds further layers to her own complicated relationship to motherhood. The choice of colour also makes us think of a wedding dress. It is an intentional irony, of course, for her to meet and talk to her ex-husband on his wedding day dressed herself like a bride. The colour of her jumpsuit also serves a rather gruesome purpose. In costume notes, we see that the costume team wanted the nurse played by Michaela Cole, to wear a light colour top to show up the blood. This was also likely the reason behind the colour of Medea's dress, to show the final horrific act all the more clearly. The car, a technical drawing of the stage with a car on it, and a detail from a Greek vase showing Medea driving a chariot pulled by two mythological beasts, half snake, half dragon. In Euripides' play, Medea escapes from Corinth with the bodies of her sons in a flying chariot, pulled by winged serpents. However, in this production, she staggers off through the forest, carrying her two sons. 
From the first production meeting notes, we learned that this was not the original plan. They mention a car that was to be driven around the back of the set, and the production files show a plan that was made to map out whether the sight lines would work. A month into rehearsals, the creative team are still discussing the practicalities of driving the car around the back of the set. It looks as if Aegeus was meant to leave the car keys with Medea when he promises he'll receive her in Athens, and that at the end of the play, Medea would get in the car and leave via this more modern winged chariot. We don't hear why the team eventually decided not to use the car, but traces of this alternative ending give us a brilliant glimpse into what might have been. Exploring the supernatural, a child rides a trike and above wedding guests dance. It is often said that Medea is a witch with access to dark, supernatural powers. She is also semi-divine. Her grandfather is the sun god Helios. The creative team found a very specific and successful way of bringing in supernatural elements into the play in a way that didn't jar with the modern setting. They drew inspiration from horror movies. In the production files, we find masses of reference materials for the set design, including lots of pictures of films like The Shining and Lars von Trier's Melancholia. These were very concrete reference points for the team. We see an echo of a wedding dance floor on the lower level of the set. Two of the chorus members looked strangely similar and stood together on the balcony when they first come on. This is a reference to the unsettling twins in The Shining. This menacing tone was also conjured by the music, written especially for the play by the pop duo Goldfrap. The ethereal qualities of the music, electronic and operatic, bring out the supernatural elements of the play. We see discussions in production meeting notes of how to create magic effects, a piece of carpet or a chair moving by itself. The effect chosen in the end was a sudden spark in an ice bucket, a prop that will be used in a later scene. Other ideas for highlighting the natural world fell by the wayside as rehearsals progressed. At one point, the team planned for it to rain in the forest on stage. The impact of this effect on practical matters such as costume is discussed in production meeting notes and rehearsal notes. Once again, we see how the rehearsal process is a crucial time for trying out ideas, not just in how actors play their parts, but in how the production as a whole achieves its overarching impact. Search for yourself. A woman watches a film in the archive. The National Theatre Archive really is a unique resource that allows you to get up close to all these incredible productions and unlock interpretations of classic texts that perhaps you'd never considered before. Anyone can book a time to access the resources of the National Theatre's archive by contacting us via our website. nationaltheatre.org.uk forward slash archive. The audio description was by Eleanor Margulies for Vocalise.